Right. So, yeah, the, this is the 10th commandment. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. And uh, God's word here says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So, sounds pretty simple. Uh, now let me, just, let me just set things up this way. Because God is not saying that you shouldn't want anything. We all want things. Uh, and it's, it's good to want things, good to work for things that you need. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have something extra to enjoy what God's made. There's nothing wrong with taking a cruise or just enjoying God's creation. So that's not really what God's saying here is to, it's not wrong to want things, but what God is telling us in this commandment is to not want what belongs to someone else. Uh, the very thing that is theirs, like his house. Let's say I like Steve's house a lot. I'm like, I want Steve's house. And so I start setting out to do anything I can to get that. And that's my whole aim in life is to get his house. And I do everything I can to do it. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> um, or uh, his wife or his servant. Steve, you got any servants? <laughs> Rick's your servant, okay. How about your ox? You got an ox or a donkey or, uh, or anything that is your neighbor's. So uh, don't covet what someone else has to the degree is that you're just whole aim in life and you won't be happy in life unless you have that. I mean, Steve could have a Corvette. I know Rick does. Uh, and I'm like, oh man, that's my dream car. I always wanted that car. I want that one. I don't want another one like it. I want that one. That's, that's, that's wrong. It's sin according to God and his word. Now, so let's kind of back up from that and ask ourselves a question. Why is this wrong? Why is it wrong to do that? Why does God tell us not to covet such things? Well, there's five reasons that I'm gonna share with you why it's wrong. And the first one is, is because it leads to other sins. When you start to covet things, it leads to other sins. Now you might be familiar with this verse from 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, you might have heard this one where Paul writes to Timothy, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You ever heard that? Yeah, that, you may have heard that just out in culture, but it came from the Bible. Uh, and, and that verse continues, it said, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So the inordinate love of money and stuff can, can cause you to wander from the faith. And so it leads to other sins. Let me, let me have you consider this, if you will, that covetousness is at the heart of all 10 commandments. It's at the very heart of all 10 of the commandments. Breaking or disobeying a commandment often has covetousness as the cause. So let's just think through the 10 real quick. Uh, the first one, no other gods before me. The covetous man or woman has more gods than one. Mammon, that's a word Jesus used, mammon is his God. Now what is mammon? If you've heard that word before and you're not sure what it is, mammon is an Aramaic word that can be understood as wealth, money, riches, or even property. So when you put 
something ahead of God, if you have an inordinate desire for something, a car, I don't know what it is that, you're, that might come up in your brain. If it's, it's something that if you say, man, if I just had blank, I'd really be happy. You know, that's, you're, you're bordering on idolatry. You're, you're getting to where you're, uh, you're having something else as a God, something that's ahead of God. You're basically saying that um, Jesus isn't enough and I need this other thing to truly make me happy. So covetousness is at the heart of no other gods because if we're not careful, we can have other things before God. Uh, the second commandment, no graven images. The covetous man bows and serves is the slave of his desires uh, of, of his desires and of mammon. So we can become the slave of our own desires and of things out there that, that we want to have. And so we bow before those things. That's where we go first. Uh, the third commandment, don't misuse God's name. Well, how is that covetous? How do we, how can that be? Well, a covetous person may sometimes throw out the name of God to try and legitimize their ends, their purpose. It becomes cloaked in religiosity. A lot of prosperity gospel teachers attempt to use God for their own ends. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and rich, say the prosperity teachers. Just have enough faith and it can be yours. So this is the scam of the century, this prosperity gospel. It's a lie and it directs many people to hell because of his deceit. So don't just misuse God's name. Don't just throw out God's name in order to create an advantage for you, uh, whether it's in a business deal or whatever. Uh, number four, don't misuse God's day. That can be used covetously. The covetous man will shop and deal and buy more than he worships the Lord. So make the Lord's day the focus of it being the Lord. Spend most of your day focusing on him rather than obtaining and getting more stuff. How about honor your parents? How can that be covetousness? Because the Bible says to honor your father and mother, not unless they don't give you what you want. You know, some people have stipulations. Well, I'll honor my parents if they do whatever. And covetousness can be at the root of that. Uh, don't murder. Many a covetous person has killed to obtain what he wanted, right? We know that. Don't commit adultery. Many a covetous person has prostituted their body out for gain, for money, uh, drugs, cars, or whatever it might be. This is even more true in our day when some people do pornographic acts online for money. And they try to make a living off of that. Many of them do. But another covetous aspect of committing adultery is just simply that you want to sexually have and be with another person who is not your spouse. You know what you want, so you commit adultery to get it, and you could probably even lump fornication in with that. And then there's the commandment, don't steal. Well, that's pretty clear, right? Covetousness is the root of theft you won't steal if you don't want it, if you don't covet it. And then don't bear false witness. Some people lie hoping for a reward, a payoff or a settlement. You know, I'll say this for you if you'll just slide me, you know, whatever. And then the 10th commandment is don't covet and that's what we're talking about now. So you can find that in all 10 of the commandments. So the first reason that we should not covet is because it leads to other sins. But the second reason is because it dishonors what it means to be a Christian. It dishonors what it means to be a Christian. Let me explain that. 
one of the major problems in the church today, and I'm just talking this church, but in all churches, is that people say that their hope is above while their hearts are below. And I want you to turn in the New Testament with me to Colossians chapter three. And there's some verses that I want us to look at here. Colossians chapter three in the New Testament, verses one through 10, because this relates to this. We're told not to covet, but we're, all, we're not left to figure out what does that look like? Well, Colossians 3, 1 through 10, gives us a picture of what that is all about. In Colossians 3, 1 through 10, the Bible says, if then you were raised with Christ, in other words, if you're a Christian and you're now raised with Christ, you have new life because you're saved, seek those things which are where? Above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things where? Above and not on things where? On the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And I like this next verse. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen? Amen. I can't wait for that day. I mean, I can, I have to, but <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm looking forward to that day. But look at verse five. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and look at this one, and covetousness, which is idolatry. See what I was saying about covetousness is that you want this thing or those things out there that you say, well, if I just had that, I'd really be happy. That's idolatry. So covetousness is idolatry. Verse six, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. In other words, you used to be that way, but now that you're saved, you're not. Verse eight explains, but now you yourselves are to put off of all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So that is what covetousness is, that's what the Christian life is supposed to be in opposition to being covetousness, being covetous. Um, so we need to not covet because it leads to other sins, because it dishonors what it means to be a Christian. But the third reason is because it brings men, and I, of course I mean women along with that, to ruin and shuts them out of heaven. It brings people, I'll say it that way, to ruin and it shuts them out of heaven. Now we just read those verses here in Colossians, but there's similar verses in Ephesians. So let's, if you'll turn back two books to Ephesians chapter five, we'll look at some uh, scripture here. Ephesians five verses five through eight. Ephesians chapter five verses five through eight. And Paul here says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, there's that word covetous again, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, you used to be that way, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So again, just another kind of angle on how to live your life as a Christian. Because a covetous man is like a bee that gets into a barrel of honey and drowns itself. That's what covetousness will do to you. A covetous man is like a ferry operator, ferry boat operator, 
who takes so many passengers to increase his money that he sinks the boat and takes everyone down with him. That's what covetousness will do to you. So we're, we should not covet because it leads to other sins, because it dishonors what it means to be a Christian, because it brings people to ruin and shuts them out of heaven. And the fourth reason that we should not covet it is because it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It can disguise itself in the attire of virtue. It cloaks itself in the name of providing for one's family. And that might be a, a justification for being covetousness. Well, I'm just doing this for my family. I'm providing for my family. Well, in Luke chapter 12, if you'll turn there, Luke 12 in the Gospels, Jesus talks about a man who went about life providing for his family, but he was not content. He felt like he never had enough. And in Luke chapter 12, we'll start in verse 16. Luke 12, beginning in verse 16. This is what Jesus said. He spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater barns. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you, uh, excuse me, for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So that's what he told himself. He was thinking about today, he was thinking about now, he was thinking about earth. But verse 20 says, God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? That man did not know he was gonna die that night. And we don't know, nobody knows. Usually, it's pretty rare if anyone knows when they're gonna die. And then Jesus says this in verse 21, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on, Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind, for all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your father knows that you need these things, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that's what Jesus said about stuff and possessions and being rich toward God but versus being rich in this world. Covetousness can be very subtle. And then the fifth reason we need to avoid covetousness is because it hinders the effectiveness or the efficacy of the word preached. 
Y'all remember back during COVID, they kept talking about the efficacy of the vaccines and all. Well, you don't hear much of that anymore. Uh, it seems like it, almost everyone who got the vaccine ended up with COVID anyway. I'm not saying anything, I'm just making an observation. Um, if you want to get the vaccine, you know, our belief in our family was if you want it, get it. If you don't want it, you shouldn't have to. But anyway, I digress. It hinders the effectiveness of the word preached, covetousness does. Because in the parable of the sower, that's another one Jesus talked about, there were different types of ground that the, the word of God fell upon. One of those types was the thorny ground, the thorns. And Christ explained that those were the cares of this world, the cares of this life. And when the word of God fell on the thorny ground, it choked out the good seed. In fact, here's what he says in Matthew 13, verse 32. He says, now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So covetousness can hinder the effectiveness of the word preached. In fact, many sermons lie dead and buried in earthly hearts. They hear the word, but they don't do the word. We preach to men to get their hearts in heaven. That's where we want them to stop thinking only on this level and start thinking about what God wants. Where covetousness is predominant, it chains you to the earth. And when we're wrapping up here in just a minute, we're gonna sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Remember the words to that? The things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So you can wait for pigs to fly before you see a covetous man living by faith. You're not ever gonna see that. So what does it mean to covet? I know I've kind of explained that, but let me just be more direct. Covetousness is, number one, when a person's thoughts are wholly taken up with the world. When a person can only think of his work or the shop or the farm or the factory, whatever it is, if that's all you think about in your next project or your next um, acquirement or paycheck, then there's covetousness. When a person is always plotting and projecting about the things of this life with really no concern at all for heaven. Uh, second thing that it means to be covetousness is when a person puts forth more effort for getting earth than they do for getting heaven. They turn over every stone, they don't get adequate rest, and they wear themselves out running after the world, but they take no pains for Christ or heaven. In other words, there's always a reason why eh, I can't get to church. Uh, number three, when all a person talks about is the world. Um, John 3, 31, Jesus said, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So when all a person talks about is the world is a sign of covetousness. It is a sign of godliness to be speaking of heaven. And it's a sign of covetousness to just always speak about secular things and never about the things of God. Number four. When he sets his heart upon worldly things for the love of them and, and because of his love for them, he will part with the heavenly things. In other words, worldly things outweigh the importance of heavenly things. So for the wedge of gold, you'll let go of the pearl of great price. And when Jesus told the young woman, sell all you have, uh, young man, actually, when Jesus told him, sell all you have and come follow me, the Bible says that he went away sorrowful 
because he had many riches. He would rather part with Christ than with all of his earthly possessions. In other words, I'm not, you know, if we knew the God he followed, right? It was his own stuff had him in control. Um, covetousness is when a person overloads himself with worldly business. He has many irons in the fire. He has so much work that he has no time to serve God. He has little time to eat, but no time to pray. And then number six, when his heart is so set upon the world that he doesn't care what un unlawful means he uses to get it. Let me just mention this verse. This is back where we read about the man who had all the property and the produce and the barns. Just before we read that passage, the verse right before that, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So, what then is the cure for covetousness? The cure for covetousness is faith in the Lord Jesus. It's trusting, believing, and knowing that God will provide for you. It's you know that you know that you know whom you have believed and are persuaded that he is able to keep that which you have committed unto him against that day. That's the cure for covetousness. It's you have hope because God always keeps his word and God will never leave nor forsake his children. That's the cure for covetousness. The cure for covetousness is in what we've been singing about this morning. Being satisfied in Jesus, that he's the one who will quench your thirst for the things of this world. That he is better than the paltry husks that the world will provide. That he is the well of water that continually springs forth. That he is the bread of life. That he will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. That every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see, on his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. So finding your satisfaction in God and his word, in salvation, in God's kingdom, and not in this world. Because the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is not in this world, in this life only. In fact, the Bible says that this world is passing away. So the cure, the cure, the way to contentment. So contentment is, I guess, the, the cure for covetousness. Well, how do we get contentment? By faith. 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You see, the root of covetousness is a distrust of God's providence. That we think, well, somehow God's not going to come through. Or God's plan can be thwarted. But faith believes that God will provide that the God who feeds the birds will also feed his children, that the God who dresses the lilies of the field will also clothe his lambs. And that's the kind of faith that overcomes the world. Faith is a remedy against covetousness. It overcomes not only the fear of the world, but also the love of the world. And I will tell you this too, unless, because I don't want you to hear me wrong, it is okay to covet some things. Let me explain what I mean by it. Paul told the Corinthians to desire the greater gifts. We need to covet spiritual things more than we do. We need to covet grace. Every day we need God's grace. We need more of God's grace. God's grace saves us, keeps us, it guides us, it grows us. His grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. So we need to covet God's grace. We also need to covet heaven. 
Because as we read a while ago in Colossians 3, if we covet heaven more, we'll covet earth less. So turn your eyes upon Jesus and let the things of this earth grow strangely dim. And then finally, we need contentment. And Paul mentions that in Philippians 4.11. He says, not that I speak in regard for need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that's where we need to be, whatever state we're in. If we're content with our own, we won't covet that which is someone else's. The less we have, and this is something for, y'all, for all of us to think about, the less we have, the less account we shall have to give at the last day. We are all stewards of what we have and we are accountable to God. If you have much, what have you done with it to the glory of God? See, that's the problem. If we have lots of stuff, that stuff can have us. But if we simplify our lives and maybe we don't have as much stuff, we become more free to do for God rather than worrying about all of our stuff. And then finally, there's no better antidote against coveting that which is someone else's than being content with what is your own. So in conclusion, let's look at Exodus 20, verses 18 through 20. This is the rest of the section about the Ten Commandments. I know it's hot, and I feel you. So I'm almost done. But let's finish this out. Exodus 20. It's probably hotter up here, by the way, because I'm, you know, heat rises. So let's look at Exodus 20, 18 through 20. It says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So as we wrap up these 10 commandments, God gave us these 10 commandments so we would know what he is like and so that we could know how to conduct ourselves in society. They also reveal to us how much we need a savior because we've all broken God's commandments and we call that sin or transgression or rebellion. And Paul said in Galatians 4.24 that the law, the Ten Commandments are there to teach and guide us as a tutor or a schoolmaster that we might be justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when it comes to the Ten Commandments, here's just a question for y'all to think about. How well are you doing? Does covetousness describe your life? It doesn't have to. God wants to save you from that inordinate desire, from things that will fade away, that can rust or can be stolen, things that won't last. If you've been listening to me this morning, the answer to covetousness is not getting more stuff. It's getting more of Jesus in your life and getting rid of stuff that keeps you from fully following him. So, You can be saved today if you're not already. Jesus will come into your life if you simply recognize and admit that you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself because salvation is not of works or merit, something that you can buy or something that you deserve. Salvation is received by sinners like you and me as we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says it is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. Salvation is free, it is a gift, it's yours for the asking. So call upon the Lord to save you and forgive you of your sins, to come into your life and take over as Lord and King of your life. When you become a Christian, you come under new ownership, under new management, 
And because when you trust in the one who defeated sin and death at the cross by rising from the dead, he takes over. He wants to be king, not only of the universe, but of your life. In fact, the Bible says that the Lord is rich toward all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then maybe there's others here today. Maybe you've been saved, but you haven't been trusting in Christ. You've been doing your thing, your way. You've been anxious. You've looked to the world and to other things besides Jesus to make you content. Perhaps there's some here today in that situation and you need to repent. So confess your sin of covetousness to the Lord and return to living and believing the way the Lord wants you to. And so as I mentioned a while ago, we're going to close out the service today with a new song. At least it's probably new to some of you. I hope some of you had a chance to preview it and you'll be familiar with it. The song is called Turn Your Eyes. And uh, let's stand and sing this song. And if I can help you today, if you have a decision you want to make about following Christ, uh, you can come and see me during the song or you can come and see me after the service. So um, if you would, please stand. I'm going to go ahead and start the song. <laughs> 